In the 13th and 15th centuries, the need to expand the production of local goods to satisfy increased international demand, stimulating the Republic of Venice to seek systems capable of attracting artisans and inventors, foreigners in particular, who were willing to bring new technologies into the city. To achieve this, an elaborate system to protect inventions and innovations was created. The first patent act in the world was enacted in 1474 in Venice, establishing that anyone willing to obtain a legal protection over their right to exploit financially a technical innovation could petition the state office of the Proveditori di Comune. When granted, the patent would last 10 years. Patent infringement would cause offenders to pay a fine of 100 ducats. All inventions produced in violation of the patent stipulation had to be destroyed. Alongside this statutory protection, there were customary protections in Venice that varied in accordance with the specific characteristics of each sector. Customary protection was based on private stipulations called privileges. The institution granting them was primarily the Senate, which, given its unconditional power, could establish the duration and the sanctions of each granting patent on a case-by-case case -case basis. This way, the Senate could customize each granting protection and promote certain innovations over others. This aspect of the Venetian privilege system has been recently examined by Stefania Fusco to show that a protection tailored to the specific characteristics of each invention would be a fairer choice than a unitary regulation which does not consider differences as in contemporary patent law. Fuscus compares the current United States patent system with the Venetian one of the Renaissance, focusing on the decision-making power of the Senate to understand what kind of incentives were provided to protect different technologies and inventions. This system, which was widely used by the Republic of Venice, promoting the technological development in all the artisan and proto-industrial sectors. For this comparison between the Venetian privilege system and contemporary patent law, she starts from the analysis of the 155 patents issued by the Senate between 1560 and 1580 for, techni for different technical innovations pertaining to various industrial sectors. By focusing on the duration and penalties for patent infringement, where longer term of durations and higher penalties were indicative of a greater interest of the Senate toward the proposed innovation, Fusco proves a market interest of the Republic towards sectors such as energy and water, arguably two strategic assets for a state, particularly the latter, given the complicating urban setting of Venice. This research is detailed and interesting, but it does not touch upon patents granting in favor of the printing sector, which indisputably played a key role in the Venetian economy. So, one of the questions is, what relevance did the printing industry have in comparison to other strategic sectors of the time? Also, what kind of incentives did the Republic adopt to attract new capital and support to the printing industry in this period and why? And lastly, who did benefit from these incentives? To answer these questions, I conducted an in-depth analysis on a total of 1,016 book privileges granted by Senate and reported in the Senato Terra Registers, preserving the Venetian State Archive. We immediately noticed that the number of book privileges found and therefore granted by the Venetian Senate is more than six times the number of patents known to be granted by the Republic to other strategic sectors in the years 1560 and 1580. 
On these sources, my study has focused first of all on examining the temporal extent of the granting privileges and sanctions established to punish potential infringements. Furthermore, using Fusco's data, I can try to fit the printing press sector in the frame of all other sectors strategic for Venice in terms of its economic standing and in terms of its management of everyday needs. The first element under observation are the sanctions that, for violation of book privileges, usually consist in the confiscation of all infringing copies and in the payment of a fine. It was customary to establish that the fine set for book privilege infringements would be divided among three different recipients. They usually were the magistrate in charge on executing the injunction, 32% of cases, one public institution, often the arsenal, 30% of cases, the accuser, 27% of cases, one charitable institution, 6% of cases, and finally the petitioner, only 5% of cases. Petitioners were hardly ever included among the recipients of a pecuniary compensation because the real incentive for requesting book privileges consisted in the legal protection received and the consequent profit earned from obtaining a dominant position in the dealing of a specific product. Now, looking at the value of the fines, we can see that the Senate fixed fines between 100 and 500 ducats, with some exceptions that see lower or higher penalties. As can be seen from the graph, sometimes the Senate established fines ranging from 10 to 400 ducats, whereas in only one case the fine was set at 1,000 ducats. In particular, 1,000 ducats were set in case of infringement of the privilege granted to Pietro Andrea Mattioli for his commentary on Dioscorides in the edition published by Vincenzo Valgrisi in 1565. The exceptional nature of this fine can be traced back to the potential bestseller status of Mattioli's book, so attractive for Venetian printers, that only an exemplary penalty was an effective deterrent to counterfeiting. However, beyond the exception, the most commonly applied sanction was the payment of a fine of 300 ducats. So, considering all applied penalties, the average is 287 ducats. This places the printing industry sixth in the list of the Republic of Venice priorities between the chemical and the agricultural sector. Anyway, the terms are probably the key elements in this analysis because they illustrate the fact that the Venetian government had the power to control the level of incentives provided to the printing press sector. In this period, the Senate granted book privileges with a duration spanning between 5 and 13 years. In particular, the Senate most frequently would grant privileges for a duration of 15 and 20 years. We are clearly very far from the standard duration of 10 years set in the 1474 law, a standard duration that was also absorbed into the book privilege system in the beginning and maintaining for some decades, as we shall soon see. The average duration of privileges granting between 1560 and 1580 was 16 years. If we compare this duration with the average duration of patents granting to other sectors, we notice that the printing industry occupies the last position. This may appear to be a discouraging factor, but we shall consider that, despite the relatively high figures, the cost to produce a single print run could hardly compete with the investments involved in the production of a new type of mill or a new method to dig channels or a mud digging machine. The motivating factor here could be, or considered, that the book industry was still the sector capable of faster turnaround time to regain expenses and accumulate some profit. However, I would like to point out that the duration of privileges progressively increases over time. 
This shows that the 10 year standard is predominant only up to 15, 60 or little after, while the 15 to 20 years duration would become the new standard in the decades between 1516 and 1518. A possible explanation for this increase could be linked to the new setting in which the Venetian economy, the Italian book trade, and the Republic of Venice in general operating during the second half of the 16th century. This period was in fact not at all favorable for the Republic. Between 1570 and 1573, the Republic was thoroughly busy fighting the Ottoman Empire to defend its dominion over Cyprus. In 1575, Venice was hit by a severe wave of the Black Plague. Moreover, after the Council of Trent, the Italian book trade started feeling the growing pressure of the counter-reformation in the form of book censorship. In this context, even though Venice was still the first printing center, other competitive printing center were emerging in Italy, Rome, Florence, Milan, Naples, it is clear that none of these cities could compete individually with Venice in terms of output, but altogether they produced a number of editions that in that competed with the Venetian production, causing Venice to lose shares of the Italian market. If on one hand the Italian printing production was growing, on the other hand the weight of Venice in the world book market was decreasing. Between 1539 and 1559, almost 60% of the editions published in Italy came from Venice. But in the years 1516 and 1580, the percentage dropped to 43. The charm of Venice was gradually obscured by the rise of new poles of attraction in Italy, but also in the rest of Europe. Despite the difficulties, the Venetian printing press did not collapse. The number of privileges granted and consequently the number of a brand new works published is an indicator of the fact that the production of original works remain high with a drop of only 8% compared to the previous 20 years. We don't know what the print runs of this, these new editions were, but the number of new editions does not show a drastic decline, with the exception of the plague years when both the number of editions and the privileges collapsed. Undoubtedly, production dynamics were affected by the series of catastrophic events that hit Venice in such a short lapse of years. However, considering to the lender duration of book privileges in Venice over time, this sequence of calamities seemed to have had more of real impact on distribution dynamics. With the, de 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 with the deterioration of the local economy and the increasingly strong rivalry among Italian and European competitors, it became progressively difficult for Venetian publishers to exhaust their new stocks hence the need for a longer legal production. This is a significant clue that a systemic crisis had started in biting the Venetian book market at large. In conclusion, the higher risk of failure combined with the difficulties of the period generating the need to promote and support the printing industry more carefully. One of the strengths of the privilege system put in place by the Venetian Senate was the setting of incentives, duration, and sanctions on a case-by-case -case basis. This allowed the Senate a level, a level of legal dynamics which granted a higher flexibility to contingencies. This was, for instance, the basic advantage of a private law system over a statutory law, like that of, of 1474 from which my presentation began. With reference to monetary sanctions, the Senate had to ensure that the set amount would be sufficient to satisfy all the recipients involved. As mentioned above, this may not only comprise the grantee or the denouncer, but also independent institution that had nothing to suffer from the infringement of a book privilege. This mobility in the allocation of rewards not only is indirect evidence of the fact that the privileged system was said to be a financially self-sufficient system, 
but it was also capable to generate a financial surplus that could be channeled in support of sensitive sectors of the state. However, sanctions, I contend, were not the direct incentive that caused petitioners to apply for a book privilege. Rather, this was the position of temporary monopoly granted by privileges. Thus, in the privilege system, the parameter that most interested petitioners and grantees was duration. For its part, the Senate used this incentive to encourage authors and publishers to produce new works, thus vitalizing the local book industry and making it more competitive on the basis of quality. Another reason behind the progressive adoption of longer durations of privilege was the Senate's aim to curb the ongoing contraction of the Venetian printing community. This was in spite of the printing industry uh, this was in spite of the printing industry being put to the test in the years 1516 and 1580, the production of new publications in Venice remained constant compared to previous decades. As highlighted by Claudio Povolo, the Venetian patricians considered the level of arbitrariness of customary law a point of honor for the Republic's legislative structure. Conversely, the tradition of statutory law was not enough to cope with the dynamism of contingencies. That of privileges is perhaps one of the examples of how the private law applied by the Senate was considered in the economic field to be the most flexible tool for managing an unpredictable environment such as the book market or the market at large. Thank you.